Hello and welcome to this podcast edition titled Enzymes. The goal of this podcast is to explain how chemical reactions are catalyzed or helped by protein-based molecules called enzymes. So as I've mentioned before, and if you're uh, tuning in for the first time, uh, the format that uh, I typically have my students do is the Cornell Notes uh, format, as you see pictured here on the screen. Uh, the title for this is Enzymes, so you'd write that across the top, and then today's date. Um, again, the major focus for uh, this uh, Q column here is any of the main ideas that you'll see presented in the podcast, um, and then any questions that you might have. Uh, alternately, you could uh, highlight or underline things that you don't understand in your notes, and then that can be a topic of discussion when we all meet together. At the end of this uh, podcast, what I'd like for you to understand are these big ideas. Number one, large molecules in food are broken down into smaller molecules uh, through a process that we call digestion. Cells then take these small molecules to build large molecules needed for cells to function. So essentially point one is taking food molecules like proteins, sugars, lipids, and then breaking those down into the small monomer pieces like fatty acids and amino acids and the like, and then using those to build up parts of our body that grow old, wear out, get damaged, so that we're constantly replenishing ourselves as we uh, go through life. And those two processes, point one and point two, are done basically by enzymes that are proteins. These enzymes regulate or control reactions that break down or build molecules needed by the cell. So it's kind of a two-way process. Some words that you may uh, not know, but are important for you to understand throughout this podcast in the study of enzymes. Uh, the first is catalyst. Uh, this is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction, but is not consumed or changed in the process. Secondly, substrate. That's the substance that's acted upon by an enzyme, so it's changed in some way. Sometimes it's called the reactant. Activation energy is the amount of energy needed to convert all reactants into products. Uh, there is a phrase that says there is no free lunch in life, and this is an example of how that's true. The active site is the specific part of the enzyme that connects to the substrate, so it's really the working end of the enzyme. It's what does the business of enzyme reactions. So this is the podcast outline. You'll see that enzymes is the general topic. Broken down, we have the form, which is how our enzymes built, what would they look like, and then you'll see that there's uh, three subtopics related to the function, specifically what are the chemical reactions that enzymes help to perform, and then there is a sort of a competing two theories, I guess you can call, uh, in biology. Biologists are not super clear on which of these works, but there is a lock and key theory or a lock and key model, and there's the induced fit model, and both these are just explanations for how does the enzyme do its job. Uh, some of it's theoretical, we don't know. Uh, since enzymes are so small, it's difficult to measure them experimentally, although we do have a pretty good grasp on how they work. So you may have seen this screenshot before. Um, I've had my students in the past do a simulation that basically explores the different factors that you see along your right-hand side of your, of your screen, the control panel, different things that you could change, either increase or decrease, that would allow you to see the effect of the enzyme. So uh, the enzyme is the green blob, the substrates, which are the target of the reaction of the enzyme is in the blue, and the green blobs turn the blue dots into the products that are red. And depending on which of these factors that you choose, enzymes, substrates, inhibitors, etc., you can see how quickly or how slowly it takes for all the blue substrates to turn into the red products. The way that the enzyme is built, or its form, its physical structure, it's made of a protein. Uh, I remember that uh, I, I taught you the polymer version of a protein is protein, and then if you break down a polymer of protein into its individual parts, they get an amino acid. And as you see in this picture, the cartoon at the bottom, the substrate in blue actually fits nicely within the enzyme, which is in the yellow. So the active site is really this space here, it's these grooves that will then fit nicely with the uh, substrate shape. So geometrically they fit well together. And then I've also explained how our hands are actually like enzymes where we can 
manipulate something or we can break toothpicks or we can put things together like Legos, for example, to simulate the action of enzymes. The enzyme attracts the reacting molecules or substrates to its active site, then releases the end products. Its effect is astounding. Each enzyme can assemble hundreds of thousands of new molecules every second. So that's basically the way that enzymes are built. Now let's take a look at what they do. So basically the function of an enzyme is to control or speed up chemical reactions. Uh, as I said before, they're made of proteins. Uh, one textbook states it as follows. Uh, Life would not be possible without enzymes, most of which are proteins. Enzymatic proteins regulate metabolism by acting as catalysts which are chemical agents that selectively speed up chemical reactions without being consumed by the reaction, meaning that they are neither uh, changed or, or altered in any way. They just keep working and keep working. So one way that we can look at the action of enzymes is through this graphic here. You'll see that the food molecules in the upper left are uh, ready to be digested. So there might be a, a turkey sandwich that you ate for lunch. Uh, the, the protein in the turkey would br be broken down into amino acids, whereas the bread would be broken down into sugar molecules. Uh, so enzymes are involved in destroying large molecules or breaking them down through what's called the catabolic pathway. And at the bottom you'll see that the uh, individual building blocks, these would be monomers like fatty acids, glycerol, glucose, amino acids, nucleic acids, that, or nucleotides, those sorts of things. And then our body uses those to build up the necessary cell structures. So for example, if you get injured and you tear a muscle, then your muscle will need to be repaired and your cells do that by recruiting or gathering up amino acids to, to fix the job. You may have uh, participated in a, a simulation or, or, or a mini lab like this. Um, I had my students recently do the uh, toothpick ace lab in which you broke toothpicks and determined how long it would take to do so. And so these are just some sample data from one of my uh, classes this, uh, this past year. And you'll see that uh, they vary so that not all enzymes are acting at the same uh, speed. So this would be different students that are destroying toothpicks. It's how long it took to uh, break, I think, 20 toothpicks. On the other side of it, uh, you could do a, an anabolic simulation where you would uh, assemble uh, Legos from just a, a pool of, of disconnected Legos. And so in, in some years I've had students do that. And so we can simulate the action of destroying and building through this process. Now when we say rate of reaction, what does that mean? Let me just take a moment and kind of explain. So the reaction rate is basically the measure of how quickly an enzyme is doing its job. So they can be slow or they can be quick. You can see that from the last slide. The formula is, is uh, provided there, so it's the final product. It's what you get at the very end. Subtracted, uh, subtracting the initial product, what you started with, and then it's the time period to take uh, that um, process to its full conclusion. So if hands are like enzymes, how could we impair them if the uh, toothpick lab or the Lego lab were done again? Uh, so in one instance, you could put oven mitts on and make it difficult for your fingers to sort of nimbly grab hold of either of those substrates. You could ice your hands and your fingers would be more numb, so it would take you longer to do that job. Uh, we could do the very same thing to enzymes. Um, so understand that you can affect the rate of reaction of an enzyme by changing things like temperature and pH and salinity. So if we compare and contrast the action of enzymes, uh, there are enzymes that destroy. So those enzymes break bonds. They take big particles, big molecules, and break them into smaller uh, particles. Uh, that starts with few things and it ends with many. So for example, if you're breaking toothpicks, you start with 10 and you break them all, you'd end up with 20 uh, reactants. So you have many more products than you have uh, reactants. Bonds are broken as you break the, the wood. On the other side, if you build something, so for example, if you did the Lego simulation, uh, you're making bonds because you're connecting small parts, making uh, bigger molecules, uh, and then you're making um, fewer big things from many small things. So you might have maybe 20 Legos that are connected into this like mega Lego and they started out with 20 individuals. So really your body is doing either of those on any given moment, any given day. 
And then what they have in common is the chemical reactions happen. They've spent some energy, so you've had to use some energy to actually physically break or physically connect um, monomers. Um, but the enzyme has not changed, so it just keeps on going, going, going. It's the workhorse of the cell. So let's talk a moment about chemical reactions. There's two kinds of chemical reactions in chemistry, one which requires energy to be input. These are called endergonic reactions, and then there are exergonic reactions which have an output of energy. So photosynthesis is an example where the sunlight is absorbed by chloroplasts, and then that sun energy is turned into glucose energy, which then can be eaten and consumed for energy. Exergonic reactions would be the opposite. So uh, energy is the byproduct. If you mix chlorine gas and sodium, uh, it makes salt, but there's also a lot of heat and light being produced. In either case, enzymes are helping the reaction to occur. So let's take a moment and talk about activation energy. So basically, enzymes help reactions to happen more quickly. They put force on bonds to break or destroy them more easily. So for example, if you set a toothpick on a table, you could reasonably predict that it would stay unbroken until someone actually physically grabs it and snaps it in two. We would not expect that it would just spontaneously snap in two. So our hands, acting like the enzymes, are actually putting force on the bonds in the toothpick to break it. So they're actually physically breaking. Or the other side of the coin is they're actually physically putting things together. So if you're building a Lego model, then it would require energy for you to put a, a Lego model together from the individual parts. So energy is required. Again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So where does that energy come from? In our bodies, it comes from ATP energy, which is the result of sugar. So we eat sugar and we make energy. So just a, a little bit of a kind of a segue here. I have an Irish background. So this is a picture of my uh, native homeland. Uh, my ancestors came from Cork, Ireland in the south of Ireland to America. And so if we were to want to take a journey and we were to want to go from point A to point C, it would make sense that going to point B first would actually be the longer leg. So the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So I bring this up to point out that enzymes are similar. So there is a shorter pathway to the reactants, between reactants and products, and there's a longer way. And it's with enzymes that we take the shorter route. So in another scenario, if we had this situation and you had to roll the rock from point A to point B, it would take a lot more energy to roll it up over the point B, which is at a higher elevation, as opposed to just running it through a tunnel if a tunnel existed, as you see here depicted by the dashed lines. So an enzyme takes the shorter route. This is a graph that you should understand and be able to interpret, and it's basically showing that the reactants at point A and their products at point B are really separated by the input of energy. So generally speaking, cells require energy to do anything. So the question is, would you rather spend a little bit of energy with the enzyme, or would you spend a lot of energy without the enzyme? So going from point A to B to C would require more energy, so you'd have to eat more food to do chemistry that way. Or with an enzyme, it just takes a little bit of energy, and that activation energy is just what you have to put into it. It's what you have to spend for the reaction to occur. Now we get to the two different models. So there's a lock and key model, and then there's the, the induced fit model. You know, it's essentially three steps. So you'll see that the enzyme is red, the substrate is, is yellow. In this case, the substrate is a food particle. You'll notice that there's a nice fit geometrically between the two. The enzyme, the red enzyme and the yellow substrate, are specific, so they complement each other. So the enzyme's active site and the substrate, noted S in the graphic, they fit together perfectly, as you see in the picture. And then the enzyme actually puts a force on those uh, substrates, the yellow food molecules, and it breaks it into two parts. So this is basically what happens during digestion. So the enzyme catalyzes the reaction or helps it happen more quickly and then it releases its product. So that's basically the idea of lock and key. So there's a specific fit between the substrate and the enzyme, just like there's a specific fit between, say, your house key and the lock on the front door of your home. Now we look at the other side of the, of the, the, the equation here with induced fit. So let's take a look at the uh, induced fit video.
According to the induced fit model, an active site almost but not quite matches its substrate when first making contact with it. The enzyme substrate interaction is enough to induce the proper fit for the substrate. Once this is completed, the chemical reaction can occur. So if we look at the induced fit description, here we go. So similar to the last one, you'll notice that uh, there is an enzyme and there is a substrate. In this case, the enzyme is not red but, but gray, and the substrate is not yellow but green. You'll notice that the substrate is actually a two-part molecule, and it has a close resemblance to the active site, but it's not perfect. So you'll see in this case, there are still some gaps between the enzyme and the substrate. So specifically this gap right here and these gaps right here, it's a close but not perfect fit. So what has to happen is the enzyme has to actually change its shape to fit more clearly the substrate. And as it does so, it's going to apply a force on the bonds connecting the two substrates. And you'll see that now they're not green, but blue and orange. And then that precedes or goes before the last step where they're, uh, they're released. So in this case, it's a, it's a destroying reaction. It's a catabolic reaction where one substrate goes in and two products leave. But again, there's a slight change in the shape of the enzyme that does that job. So let's talk a brief moment about the factors that affect enzymes. So activity uh, levels of enzymes can go up and go down. Enzymes can become more quick or more slow based on several things. First of all is temperature. So kinetic energy or, or, or heat is what helps things to move more quickly or more slowly. So uh, molecules at low temperature tend to move more slowly. They tend to collide with each other less often. Therefore, the chemical reactions that happen when they collide are going to be slower. The opposite is also true, that as you increase temperature, the molecules move more quickly, they will collide with each other more often, and therefore the chemical reactions will happen more quickly. So there's a kind of a sweet spot, sweet spot between the high temperatures and the low temperatures in our bodies. Um, body temperature 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is approximately 37 degrees Celsius. And so you'll see that 37 is right uh, between 35 and 40. So there's kind of this Goldilocks kind of zone of temperature that our enzymes like to be in. Too hot, too cold is not good for enzymes. Secondly, salinity can be uh, an issue. So uh, salt content, how much salt you have in a solution can affect the way that enzymes uh, do their job. And then lastly, pH is a factor. So you'll see in the, in the graphic to the right, uh, various enzymes and the pH values that they prefer to be at. And you'll see that they're, they're widely varying. For example, pepsin is at a low pH value, so it's high acid content. We would expect that because pepsin is found in our stomach and uh, aids in digestion of food particles. Uh, catalase, uh, lipase, urease, those are uh, examples of enzymes that prefer to be more in the neutral zone. So summary, we have lock and key model versus the induced fit. You can see there are similarities and differences. And then finally, you should be able to take what you've learned through this podcast, draw this diagram after you've done your summary. This then becomes your exit task. And then this label which part is which. And so use the word bank at, uh, at the bottom of the screen. So there you go. And that wraps up this podcast. I hope that this made the study topic more clear to you. Please write down any questions you want help uh, understanding, and we'll discuss it when we meet next. Until then, please keep up studying.